Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the final CDS uh, Q&A session for 2021. Um, it's been enjoyable having you guys join us weekly. I think the panel's really enjoyed the opportunity to answer questions um, as they're coming in from the field. And uh, again, a reminder to post your questions to either the chat or the question box if you have any. Um, First, uh, while people are thinking of questions and posting them to the to the chatter question box for me, um, John heard uh, there's been a bit of chatter on Twitter, uh, and Anastasia Kubinek um, had posted a picture looking at corn following canola versus corn following peas on a piece of land, and I was wondering whether you or anyone else on the panel would like to comment on this because the corn following the peas i think was if i recall correctly was looking a lot better anything you want to say john about you know uh corn after canola syndrome anything like that that was striking uh, in terms of what might be going on in that particular field well first uh other than anastasia being a great tease she was a a, a great leader for us at the office there and she knew that if she put that on twitter that i would have to go to the same field to verify it and uh Yes, what I see with my eyes when I'm there, I see what uh, we've dealt with in the past. It is the corn after canola syndrome uh, where we don't have active mycorrhizae in the field to assist with early season phosphorus uptake. And it was really reminiscent of the same research done by Don Flayton and Magda Rogalski at the University of Manitoba where uh, Magda saw huge differences basically in crop maturity. It's, it's uh, uh, in crop development. That early plant doesn't get the phosphorus it needs. And the interesting thing in Magda's research, when they had long seasons with good growing conditions, moisture, that yield just about narrowed because there was enough season, uh, but it was always slower and wetter at harvest. Uh, in Real problems is when it's in years when there isn't a long season or something like that. In those cases, you know, we're seeing up to a, a 10% yield difference. And again, two to three points wetter at harvest without, uh, uh, you know, when we followed the, in her studies, it was uh, following canola versus following soybeans. So that's what I was thinking. But there might, as some of my colleagues there may have some other opinions on what that difference was that made the corn after peas look better than the corn after canola. Yeah, I would agree with John that um, that mycorrhiza effect would be strong in the field, but it's likely, you know, sometimes when we see differences like that, it's attributed to a few factors. So it could also be the water usage of those two crops. So there would be differences in the water use of canola versus peas. And then also maybe the nitrogen effect of, you know, any nitrogen that would be left in the soil after that pea crop. So, you know, in cases like this, it's often probably a few factors that are contributing to differences in the field. Mm -hmm. Well, well, one of uh, our interested listeners on the on the Twitter, the Edgar Hammermeister, I really liked his comments in that you know sometimes the nitrogen contribution from peas is overrated, but we sometimes underrate that that pulse benefit, which, you know, is, is a number of, of intrinsic factors, uh, nitrogen part of it, but yeah, crops just seem to like growing after pulse crops, uh, such as peas. Yeah, and that's a good point. Like in terms of understanding what that end mineralization or nitrogen benefit might be, and how do we actually, in the long run, John, measure what that pulse benefit is versus the end benefit? Like how do we know exactly what we're going to be kind of assuming for that yield bump that might that may actually occur following peas or do oh, we sure. do a lot of it? don't get me going on this marla I, I i sampled two pea fields last fall every two weeks and i didn't measure any nitrogen build up but that's because it was so dry last fall i don't think there was any mineralization that happened uh there was a bit of a bump this spring but yeah if we don't have good mineralization conditions, meaning uh, moisture in the fall, we may not see that nitrogen till later, but our book value suggests that, uh, uh, you know, we may expect uh, between 
15 to 25 pounds of uh, nitrogen uh, credit following peas. Uh, some people accept that credit. Others just say, hey, that's part of the pulse benefit and I'll look for extra yield and extra protein and wheat if I follow those uh, crops. Excellent. Um, John, staying on, since we've got you unmuted, uh, staying on topics of fertilizer. Um, so, and, and, and the concept of fertilizer use, I guess, because I mean, dry season has been a bit of the theme of the year. Uh, and uh, if fertilizer prices being high, um, not sure how much fertilizer that I added this year was actually taken up. Like, what do I need to know in order to manage this situation? Am I, is it how critical, like, is it absolutely critical? I'm assuming that the answer is always gonna be yes, but to be um, doing that testing, soil testing in the fall to be able to figure out what the plan is. Um, what do we need to know about the conditions this year and the, the nutrient use by the crop, whether it's less than we expected or hoped it to be? Yeah. Uh, well, yes, uh, good job of answering the question for me, Marla. Soil testing will be essential to know what's there uh, because, uh, but you probably want to, as a, as a farmer, want to make sure you book your soil sampling uh, person to do that. They're going to need some good equipment to get through this dry soil because we do want to access the full two foot depth and uh, in order to make plans. Uh, and another kicker is some people, if they're salvaging their crop as a uh, 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 forage, uh, for example, uh, oat hay or something like that, well, then actually they've had a, quite a bit of crop removal. They may have removed more nutrients than normal, particularly potash. So uh, really, uh, the field should be tested to know what we're dealing with. One thing that is interesting, uh, you, you may be aware of this, Marla, because you've done Africa work, but we may deal with the Africa phenomena called the birch effect. And that is when we do get a little bit of moisture, we're going to see a burst of uh, nitrogen uh, as uh, uh, the microbes decompose, the ones that have succumbed to the heat. And so we're going to see a, a little bit of a burst in, in nitrogen. And it may take some special interpretation from some of your agronomists in order to explain that and factor that into a, a real recommendation. What about timing of soil sampling? Is there any impact of timing your soil sampling in the fall? Uh, yeah, not, not if it's going to stay bone dry, but if we do get uh, moisture this fall, uh, nitrogen levels may change somewhat. Uh, they tend not to change that much if we're following cereals, uh, but if we're following canola or, or pulse crops, uh, we would expect a bit more of a, uh, an increase in nitrogen as we go through the fall. And uh, that may just need to be factored in. Uh, I expect a lot of people would be sampling uh, right after the combine with uh, cereals. And those nitrogen levels tend to be more static than uh, following, for example, peas or uh, 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 canola. Um, and so staying to the, the discussion of fertility, um, but moving into corn specifically, um, so we're thinking about, you know, whether or not our corn crops, which obviously uh, might be suffering a bit in these hotter, drier conditions, um, and we're kind of questioning how adequately we fertilize, especially since some people maybe tried, you know, thought about split applying nitrogen and didn't put on that second application or held back some nitrogen. How do you know if you've actually adequately fertilized your corn crop at this stage in the game? Uh, that's a good question that hopefully John can help answer. But I think like at this, in a, in a year where it's dry, it can be tough to tell. So like if you have a, you know, a good looking corn crop, the leaves are green. If you do start to see yellowing, like in an adequate moisture year, if you do start to see yellowing of those lower leaves, then you would be concerned that you didn't adequately fertilize your corn crop. In a year where it's dry, in some fields that I've been in, you know, all the leaves are green, they look great. Other fields, they they started to dry dry off and fall off maybe even four weeks ago. So it can be tricky to tell in this dry year, um, you know, if you've adequately fertilized. I don't know if John has another comment. 
Uh, I'm just going to say that, uh, 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 Marla, you're setting us up to say, if you want to know, come to the field day on Thursday. Uh, uh, we're having a four-hour nitrogen field day uh, just north of St. Claude, and you have to register with that for Mario Tenuta. But uh, really, I wanted to hear Anne tell me about uh, how do I do a pregnancy test for my corn crop to see if it's actually had pollination? And you're going to do one of these pregnancy tests for us at the field day. So how would I do that? Yeah, there, so there's two ways to tell if your corn fertilized properly. The first is just to wait, do the old fashioned wait and then see what's developing under the corn cobs. So you'd have to wait probably 10 days after the corn's been fertilized to see if you actually have those developing kernels. So if you actually see those bumps on the cob. If you're impatient, like we are, um, a few days after the corn's been successfully fertilized, you can tell. Um, so once the corn is successfully fertilized, the silks will fall off of the developing kernel area. So each silk is a, is a tube that connects the pollen um, to the developing embryo. So you know, after you know the silks have been out and the tassels have been out shedding pollen, you can carefully pick some cobs, carefully peel back the green um, the husk, and then if you hold the corn and just gently shake it, anywhere where the kernel's actually been fertilized, that silk will fall off. So if the silk is still attached to the cob, then you know that it hasn't been fertilized yet. So that's a good way to tell, you know, what you're starting to see in your, in your cob. And we know that, you know, in corn, often the tips don't develop kernels. So even on a good year, it's good to see like how much of that tip, how, how far down the cob are kernels going to be developed. In a year like this, where um, it's not ideal fertilization conditions, just because it's been hot and dry, um, it'll be good to do that just to kind of give us a yield estimate as well. Awesome, so apparently, contact Mario, um, register for the four hour tour and uh, show up on Thursday uh, as well, if you wanna learn a little bit more about what we've been talking about this morning, which is always good to have a plug for other educational events that we've got going on that we're involved in or if we're not involved in them, that too. Um, so uh, I want to touch a bit on diseases. And I know uh, Dave Kaminsky isn't here, but Dane, um, specifically when we're talking about uh, black leg, uh, club root, things like that, if we are scouting at this stage in the game, um, as we're you know getting towards swathing, so we've got these opportunities for sc scouting, what do we need to know about scouting? And then, how do we actually go about like taking samples, sending samples in? Like, how do I get any analysis on whether or not I've got like the disease um, situation, I guess, in my crop at that point in time? Oh, you're muted, Dane. Sorry about that. Um, any time from about mid-June to mid-August, late August, about harvest, is is ideal window to scout for club root. Uh, club root is not particularly easy to detect this year, especially uh, given the fact that we've had dry conditions, we've got weird looking fields, stunted looking plants all over the place, and, and it'll be difficult to isolate the symptoms of club root because that's what club root acts like. It acts as a drought agent by pinching off and choking off those plant roots not allowing that crop to uptake. So that's where we're always looking for a, a stunted or a smaller crop in a, in a healthy looking canola field. So if you have spots that you can't attribute to drought or you have a relatively well watered field, and if you're seeing some of those odd looking spots, that's definitely a sign to go out and look. Uh, right now, between now and swathing, just after swathing, uh, take along a shovel and dig up some of those roots. Just take a look at the roots and see what's there. If the roots look healthy and, and thick, uh, with the texture of about a carrot, and you should be fine. If not, uh, there could be something uh, going on there. But we get asked about soil testing for club root. Yeah, can I preemptively or, or, or predict where uh, club root spores might be moving? Yes, you certainly can. You can test any time of year. However, if you're going to be testing your fields regularly or semi-regularly, try and test the same time of year because spore populations will fluctuate. They'll increase. Um, right after harvest as the crop material and root material break down, releasing new spores, and they'll be at their lowest, um, typically in, in June, early July, when whatever spores are in the soil have moved into canola roots to begin infection. So if you're gonna test, just maintain that same time of year consistency. 
take a cup full of soil right from the surface, right from the root zone, and your field driveways, entrances, exits, uh, those low spots, those bathtub breaks around all those spots. And you can send in soil samples to mbtestlab.ca. Check out that uh, webpage link. It'll give you all the instructions there. It'll give you the protocol on how to test. And uh, testing is free for Manitoba farmers that are members in good standing with MCGA. So that's the promo program that they are running. And uh, we encourage people to take advantage of it. But for Black Lake, um, Black Lake is done mostly at swathing or, or just prior to swath timing. We are about to start our disease survey in Canola uh, across Manitoba. So if, uh, you as agronomists or, or your farmers are on the call, uh, we're looking for fields in basically every RM. And sometimes we will be hitting repeat customers or repeat farmers. We'll go back to year after year. There's always uh, opportunity to add in new ones. So if you're interested in having your field checked for black leg and scotinian and any number of other diseases, um, please send myself an email or, or Dave Kaminsky, and we will add you to the list and, and uh, get a little more detail from you. But for black leg, if you're on your own out there, um, take a pair of sharp shears. Pruning shears work really well. Head out into the field. Take, go at least 20 paces off the headland and do a W or a Z pattern. You're going to stop at one point. You're going to pull up about 20 plants. You're going to examine the roots first since you're there anyway and snip off the root where the uh, stem meets the root tissue right at that soil line level. Snip it off there and then you're going to look at the cross section. You're going to examine that and you're looking for a black smudge or a black ring. Now, there's two different diseases there. A smudge is an indicator of black leg, and the percentage infection depends on how much uh, smudge or, or, or blockage you have at the base of the stem. If it's more of a starburst, faint gray halo type effect, that's very likely verticillium stripe. And that disease is becoming more and more widespread in Manitoba. We're not uh, certain as to the economic impact yet. It does seem to be limited to late season infection. Uh, but just so you know, it, to not confuse it with black leg. Uh, you mentioned, uh, Dane, earlier about how um, there would to uh, submit samples, and if you're a good member and good standing with the MCGA, then that gets you into kind of their monitoring program. What other monitoring programs are going on right now, um, specifically within management agriculture, that we need to bring right. Oh, for sure. Right now we have the uh, canola disease survey. I, I mentioned that too. That's underway. So we're looking for all kinds of diseases in canola. Um, visual symptoms up for club root, black leg, sclerotinia, verticillium stripe, uh, foot rots, maggots, um, aster yellows, all kinds of things. We also have the disease survey programs running for cereals, which I believe is wrapping up. And is that uh, right? Yeah, we should be finishing that up uh, this week. Okay, sounds good. So that would be mostly fusarium in, and leaf diseases in spring wheat. And did you add barley in this year? Yes, yeah, spring wheat and barley. Okay. And uh, Dave Kaminsky is also running the soybean disease survey. So that is underway right now. If you're looking for volunteering a soybean field, we're, we'll be tracking whatever new and emerging diseases are coming in soybeans. And at the end of our surveying program, usually about Christmas time, we'll get the uh, results piled and, and put together and those who submitted a field will get an email report saying this is what we found in there and then we try to compare it against provincial and regional averages so you have an idea whether you were good bad or, or have some areas to improve on and yeah i should uh, get Lori my email address and contact information so if anybody's on the call as agronomists or farmers uh, we typically struggle finding fields particularly in the western side of manitoba um, if you have names and contacts that would be interested in, in receiving a report and, and having us in your field, please do not hesitate to send me an email and we'll get the information from you and, and figure out how to go from there. Yeah, and we'll be following up the end of today's session with uh, uh, a kind of last email out to participants. And in that email, I plan to make sure that all of our contact information is listed in it. So again, uh, if you have any fields that you want to put forward, then you would have Dane's contact in order to uh, get involved in those fields. Uh, another thing I just wanted to point out, we had a question came in about details for the field day on Thursday. Um, and so I just posted into the chat the contact information. So to contact Mario Tenuta, um, by the end of today, today is the deadline to register. 
Uh, his phone number is listed there, 204-290-7877. Uh, there are two group showings, uh, maintaining COVID protocols so that you're keeping the people under 25. Um, I believe the last tweet that I just looked at, he said they had 43 registrants. So space is limited. If you wanna get involved um, or to register, contact Mario and you'll be assigned to either the 10 a.m. or the 1 p.m. showing. And John Hurd is, where is the field located? Uh, yeah, it's just north of St. Claude. Uh, I have some very gaudy signs that'll be posted the morning of. So if you drive on that paved road, uh, but really, I don't know if Mario wants people to know where the field is, if it's by pre-registration only. Exactly. So, uh, yeah, pre-register and then you'll know exactly where the field is. Yeah, I was going to say, I did not post the field location in my little thing here. So, uh, but generally, then you know uh, generally where the field area would be around St. Claude. Um, okay. Uh, John Kablowski, uh, I wanted to ask about Diamondback Moth, and uh, I just wanted to know whether, like, what's going on right now? What do we need to know in terms of, uh, like, Diamondback, anything else? What are the traps looking like? Tell us everything you know. Okay, well, as far as the traps go, the traps really uh, serve to tell us when they've blown in and generally what numbers. So we put those up in May and June. They come down the end of June. Uh, trap data this year generally was showing in most areas low risk, but we did have a few uh, traps I would say were more moderate to high. Although, this is the big although, uh, we really don't have good data to enable us to use trap counts to say, uh, here's where you're gonna have economic populations. There are a heads up saying um, something looks to have blown in but uh, there, there isn't good data en enabling us to say low risk, moderate risk, high risk. These are the areas um, more likely to be inf infected the way we can with say Bertha Armyworm where it's been a bit, uh, well, I guess where the research has had better correlations. Uh, people have tried to do the research with diamond black moth, um, but just it uh, doesn't correlate well. So uh, we did have a few higher counts in the east and the south interlake. Right now, what we're seeing for larva is most of the heavier populations are in the east and the southern interlake. Um, further west, I haven't heard of any reports of high populations, but certainly the area um, Emerson up to Steinbeck seems to be a hot spot in the southern interlake. Uh, uh, Gimli, Riverton, Arburg area. There's some fields there that I know were treated for diamondback moths. So there are pockets, areas where uh, there certainly were some heavier levels in the field. The really tricky part this year is knowing when's it economical to spray. Um, we do have economic thresholds. They're nominal thresholds. Um, some entomologists don't even agree with them. They, they are nominal. They're our best guess. Um, what uh, doesn't make sense to a lot of us is the uh, threshold for immature to flowering plants is lower than for potted plants. And really with diamondback moth, it's the feeding on the pods that's going to lose you yield. Feeding on buds and flowers in most years won't result in significant yield loss. Uh, canola usually overproduces for flowers and buds and it can compensate. Now, if you're in extreme drought, the plants won't compensate as well for that flower and bud feeding. Uh, areas that got some rain, um, likely that flower and uh, uh, bud feeding isn't going to be too consequential. Good to be keeping an eye on things um, when it's still in that flowering stage. But again, the feeding on the pods is really what is gonna lose you yield. That's what you have to focus on preventing if there's going to be a lot of it. So that's the most critical. Um, as an aside, th there is a research study in Alberta where they are reevaluating the economic threshold for diamondback moth. We hope to have a quantitative threshold. We think the numbers we're using now might be a bit low, especially the ones for immature to flowering stage. So those are the diamondback threshold and the ligus threshold are both being reevaluated right now 
and we're, we're actually having a conference call this morning to discuss whether or not we should even be using the thresholds for ligus that are currently in our guides. We figure those, those are much too low as well. John, I had a real quick question. I've had a number of calls with the growers and agronomists over the past couple of days about late season flea beetle feeding. I mean, we, we know that that's typically not a big yield robber and they can be out in extremely high populations. Um, but given the state of the canola crop across Manitoba, will that impact an economic threshold to spray? Is it necessary? Um, I'm thinking of flea beetles that are mostly on what I've seen the better looking canola uh, where there's been some more moisture. Uh, so there was some decent yield potential there still and numbers were approaching 100 bugs per plant. Yeah, the, the tricky part with this, uh, sometimes um, management decisions are both a science and an art. And the, the science part, there, there was a study to try to determine an economic threshold for late season flea beetles on canola. That was by Julie Soroka and Larry Granko in Saskatoon. Um, they basically concluded that flea beetles were not economical late in the season. Um, they had up to 300 per plant in their study and weren't detecting economical yield loss. The tricky part to this is this was before we got into our, our drier cycle. Uh, so the canola was growing reasonably well in their study. Um, but even, even when they were getting uh, 300 plus per plant, they still they, they didn't produce a threshold because they said it just wasn't economical. Now that being said, um, We've gotten into a drier cycle and we did have some fields last year where you could visibly see that the pods were really taking a beating along the edges of some of the, the fields. And the, the yeah, so uh, this is where it's an art and a science. Uh, we, the research has been done and suggested they're not economical, but I would say still keep an eye on things and use some judgment in spite of what we might tell you at times. Uh, if it, you can sometimes visibly see where it's going to be economical. Um, so as much as I would like to say it's not economical, don't worry about it, I still qualify that with uh, keep an eye on things and use your judgment as well. Yeah, it yeah. sounds really great, thanks. Yeah, that's the, the standard it depends answer. Um, that uh, uh, if, and, and the art and the science involved in all of this. And if it wasn't a struggle and if the answers weren't simple, then we wouldn't be in this business because we actually find it, this is what makes life intriguing for us when it's not a cut and dry type of, uh, type of an answer for these types of issues. Um, so this brings us to the end of the questions that have been coming in. Um, I do want to, and we're also nearing nine now, a couple of things just to wrap up. One is uh, Kim Brown is speaking on Crop Talk tomorrow on pre-harvest options. And so if anyone's interested in hearing what Kim has to say, uh, tune into Crop Talk tomorrow because that'll be a great opportunity to be able to ask her questions. I believe the panel will also be on at the end of Crop Talk for any other kind of questions coming out of today. Um, and uh, I am going to, as I mentioned earlier, send a follow-up email. There'll be an evaluation for people who have participated uh, to be able to ask a few questions on kind of the format and things and how this went. Uh, in that, I will also have the contact information for all of our panelists so that if you have other questions that you want to ask, you've got contact info to be able to track all of us down. Um, but with that, I want to thank all of you for attending, for submitting questions, asking questions during our sessions. Uh, it's this has been a very enjoyable way for us to still be able to speak to you guys kind of in the moment throughout this part of the growing season uh, and provide that information that can be quite useful, hopefully, to you guys. Um, and thanks again to all of our panelists for being here every week and for participating and answering all of the questions that come in. I really appreciate that uh, support and I think the attendees probably appreciate it too. So virtual applause to all of you. Thank you again for um, your efforts in uh, this CDS in a different year again. So next year, hopefully we'll be back in person again in our standard field uh, situation. Uh, but for now, this is what you get, and hopefully you got a lot out of it. So thank you again for everyone, and we will see you in 2022. Bye, everyone.